and thanks for joining us today for our session on how to handle online risks, discussing content curation and moderation in social media. Um, I would like to clarify that this is not a session on robots, which was previously mislabeled. So if you're here um, to look at robots or discuss robots, this is not the right session. <laughs> um, so I'd like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Yvette Wan. I'm here with my colleagues, Casey Fiesler, Melinda Chowdhury, and Nate Matthias. And um, we will be uh, um, more facilitating this panel. This is really meant to be an interactive discussion. Um, if we were here just to express our opinions, you could read our extended abstract, but really we want to have a discussion with the audience, uh, especially with people um, from industry as well. So just to give a brief um, overview of this panel, we are thinking about um, the uh, proliferation of online negativity and harmful content on social media, which can include things such as fake news, harassment, et cetera. And we want to have this active discussion on the pen potential roles that different actors play in these systems uh, in curating, moderating, and studying this type of content. Um, just to be clear, we acknowledge that companies already have a varying range of practices that are in place in terms of how they moderate or curate content. Um, uh, there are different methods, like some are more human-centered, some rely on algorithms, and so we will, um, keeping in mind that these practices are already in place, we want to discuss four main questions Starting off with, uh, should social media companies engage in this type of content moderation? What kind of factors should be taken into consideration? What role do academics have? And um, looking at uh, kind of more of a discussion of the audience on these uh, varying topics. So before we go on, I'd like to uh, give an opportunity to our panelists to introduce themselves and their research and why they decided to participate in this panel. I'm Nate Matias. I just defended my PhD last week at the MIT Media Lab, uh, headed to Princeton next academic year. And I study basically people being terrible to each other on the internet and what we can do about it. 
Or to put it another way, uh, how to have a fairer, safer, and more understanding uh, internet. And I look at what we can actually do to create social change or other kinds of change, and how we can know that what we did actually was beneficial. So over the last couple of years, I have worked with uh, online communities and internet users to support them to do their own independent field experiments and A-B tests that allow them to build parallel knowledge to uh, what companies and platforms are able to do internally. So that the, in the case of the United States, the nearly 100 million people have taken some action uh, to intervene or support people who face online risks can themselves have actionable knowledge about how to make a difference in their communities. Thank you. Um, we also had uh, a fifth panelist, Libby Hemphill, who unfortunately couldn't make it today for uh, family issues. Um, just to briefly introduce my work, um, and I'm Yvette Wan. Um, I study uh, social media and well-being, and I'm particularly interested in how small design decisions can nudge different types of behavior in online communities. So, for example, if you change the like button to a hug button, does that feel different for someone who's, who's receiving it? Um, so that has been um, my research in the past few years. So um, without further ado, I'd like to move to our first question. Um, which is about should social media companies intervene in moderation or curation? And um, before we proceed with this, I'd like to remind you that uh, Kai um, currently has a tool for um, submitting questions if you feel shy about coming up to the microphone. Uh, it's Slido. You can use the hashtag uh, Kai2017 and submit your questions to our panel, which is how to handle on online risks. Otherwise, um, there is a mic uh, in the middle of the room. I'd encourage you to please step, step up and, um, and share uh, your opinions or insights or experience with us. Um, so uh, to go back to the first question, the first question was, should social media companies engage in content moderation? I'd like to invite anyone up to the microphone at this point or we can start off with one of our panelists. So I think that, um, so I think that it's very easy to give lots of reasons why there should be a yes to this question, right? So we can think of lots of types of harmful behavior. Um, we've mentioned some of these already. Harassment, cyberbullying, um, some behavior and content that like some of the things that Lindon was talking about. Um, copyrighted content would be an example of things that some people might care about, for example. Um, so I think we can think of lots of reasons of why it's a really, it would be a really good idea for social media companies to deal with some of, some of this kind of content. Um, the reasons why not tend to be a little more nuanced. Um, so since I'm, since I'm the lawyer on the panel, I will bring up free speech, um, which is one of those really nuanced things, right? Um, some platforms have handled this very differently. Um, Reddit is an example of a platform where it was originally intended to be this highly democratic, like the wild, wild west of, of free speech from the very beginning. Um, and so has had some more permissive policies towards content um, than some other platforms. Um, a platform that I have studied, Archive of Our Own, which is a fan fiction platform, has a very clear line on the kind of content that they allow, and that line is legality. If it's legal, we allow it. If it's not legal, we don't allow it. Others are a lot fuzzier because these lines to draw are a lot fuzzier. So for example, what is online harassment? What constitutes harassment? Um, some of the work that I've done shows that everyone has a different definition and no one can figure out what it means, and so it's very hard to follow, follow rules around that. Um, so there's been lots of different ways that platforms have handled this, but it's kind of difficult for it to be a yes or no question, because if you say no, we're never going to moderate any content ever, um, then you run into the kinds of problems that, we, that we've already discussed. Um, so I think it's actually very difficult to give that a, a, a binary answer to that question. And if I could 
add to that. I think uh, there's been this way that people start by asking, is this right or not? Should this be allowed or not? And that's kind of taken us down directions that don't always allow us to ask this risk question that is in the title of the account. Right? It's not just a question of, should this content be allowed or not, but what are the risks that we're encountering? And what are the effective ways to address them? Less about censorship or removal and more about this broader world of policy. And perhaps I can share one practical example that I heard just last week from Nigat Dad, who is uh, the founder of the Digital Rights Foundation in Pakistan, and who created Pakistan's first online harassment hotline just a year ago. And Nick, when, when Nigat looks at these risks, often they are risks to life. So she told the story of someone who was very active on social media, um, who as a woman was able to express her views and identity pseudonymously online in ways that might have been more difficult uh, if she were revealing her identity. And in fact, uh, when, um, when her like, identity was revealed, uh, that put her in risk of life. We need to get back from her family. And this piece can be life or death matters. At the same time, um, even as platforms might want to preserve certain kinds of anonymity uh, to help protect people, um, those same uh, kind of dynamics of culture and norms uh, can create other risks. So in Pakistan, uh, there are laws against blasphemy. And that sometimes results in the death penalty. And in fact, in many cases, they don't, the cases don't go through the whole way through the judicial system because people are sometimes lynched if it is believed if we believe that they engaged in the blasphemous behavior. And so in Pakistan, as Mega was describing, people will create fake profile accounts purporting to be uh, from a particular person that they hope will then pin blasphemy on someone and then incite violence from others. So when we think about online risks, um, these are the challenges that platform operators, that civil society organizations, that law enforcement, that governments around the world are having to try to not just strike a balance, but find any foothold, any purchase on how to protect people while also working within local uh, cultural and legal context. So just a quick reminder for those of you who just walked in, we're currently discuss discussing whether social media companies should engage in content moderation. And I welcome anyone who uh, has a pr perspective to share to uh, co come approach the mic in the middle of the room, please, or submit questions through Slido.
those kinds of uh, sharing practices eventually uh, lead to uh, some unfortunate outcome. The question becomes, could moderation have played an important role there? Hey guys, it is Dr. George Tech. Uh, thank you for doing this panel on this topic. You know, I think um, we need to break this question down a little bit, and I want to break it down in two different dimensions. First of all, I, I think we can't talk about online as one thing. So uh, there are different sites, and part of the answer to your question is that it's important that different sites have different standards, and that there be highly moderated places where people who want to be protected can go, and that there are unmoderated places where people who have potentially unpopular views can express them. Uh, so I don't think we can talk about the online as if that makes sense, right? We've got to talk about where online. Second, I think we need to separate the uh, corporate policy moderation from the legal regulatory framework. Uh, so there's a big difference between what you can do on vote versus Facebook, and that's a different question than what you can do in the U.S. versus Germany. Uh, so uh, I, I think as that's just a comment that we need to divide things in, on these two different dimensions. Uh, following up on that, my question for the panel is uh, the hate speech laws are dramatically different uh, across countries. Mm -hmm. What lessons do you take from that, uh, and what do we do about it? Yeah, we were actually discussing this earlier at lunch today, and um, although like a lot of the major social media companies are their headquarters are based in the U.S., they're a global service, and societal norms as well as legal situations are very different. Uh, what is considered acceptable in one culture is not in the other, and um, how will we deal with this at a local level when in fact people are connected at a global level? So I think that's like one of the complexities of dealing with the situation and kind of hoping that companies will have a uniform policy I think is to some extent unrealistic um, because there are so many cultural nuances in place. across the many different places where their users live is really hard to the point where their policy will say no hate speech <laughs> and then what does that mean um, and how do they and how do the users even learn what that means so if, if if content is being moderated so it's being deleted when it's posted especially if it's being deleted algorithmically um, so for example the way that uh, yik yak worked where if you posted um, a word that their algorithm considered to be hate speech, it would just delete the post, or it would downvote it so that it was deleted. Um, in which case, no one would see it, and so no one would know that it had been deleted. And so how do you learn, how do you learn what kind of behavior is unacceptable or what kind of content is unacceptable um, if there's no way to make those norms visible? Um, which I think is another, another problem um, with thinking about how we moderate content? Is there a way to make it more visible, more transparent, so that the communities can learn, to, can learn what those norms are? Even if, even if it's something as simple as what constitutes hate speech on this platform versus this, this platform. And if it's something like Twitter, you're never going to know because there's like a million different communities inside of Twitter. I agree that there are nuances to um, how we think what we consider to be hate speech or not, and uh, that is not just different in different uh, cultures, but it also is different in different uh, platforms. Um, and uh, learning that, uh, factoring in the community that we are talking about is, is, is a challenge, because oftentimes uh, communities and the, um, the, the moderation uh, strategies are uh, adversarial in nature, I really appreciate your question because it, 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 it's one, it like points to the kind of complexity and like the wicked problem in nature of not just what do we do online, but like 
what is justice and governance and how do we determine it? And I think there are maybe three conversations that when we bring them together can help us make progress. Right? One of those conversations is a conversation about what is just. And, and we see that conversation play out when different cultures and governments arrive at different decisions about, say, what hate speech is and how to do it. They have that conversation. But um, as like uh, Kwame Anthony Apaya points out in his book on cosmopolitanism, there's this tension where you know, we might want uh, communities to make their own decisions, but we still might want to be able to criticize or evaluate the degree to which that justice plays out in context different from our own. And I think that's where the second conversation about legitimacy, which kind of goes back to Weber and like, political theory, um, and to conversations about like what is legitimate government. If there's a society where um, the laws have been crafted in a way that overrides the will of the public, or is not conducted in a way that, as I as a pro-democracy, open society person, would say, this isn't being done with the consent of the government, that might give me grounds to like criticize or engage in a conversation about how things might be different. But then there's this third conversation that I think absolutely needs to be part of, the, uh, part of it. And Moon Moon has already alluded to it. It's this conversation about the effectiveness of governance. Uh, we may find ourselves in a situation where a society agrees that something constitutes hate speech and something should be done about it. We might learn that those policies were derived and enacted in a legitimate way. Definition, but we may discover, as Instagram may have discovered, um, that like, the outcomes are the opposite of what we need. And that's the point where I think, as researchers, we can meaningfully speak into all of those conversations, whether we do qualitative work, whether we're engaged in political philosophy, or whether, you know, like me, we're doing field experiments to support public discussion is part of a legitimate open governance uh, to make informed decisions about uh, their policy based on what actually those policies achieve in the world. Yeah, that's a great point. And to go back to kind of Amy's question or a comment about not all, all online is the same, for example, like research can show that certain words in certain communities are very offensive. For example, if you're playing the online game Overwatch, if you say good game easy, that is actually a very demeaning uh, statement, which would not be considered so in any other community outside of there, which you would not know unless you were doing qualitative research inside that platform. Um, so I think I, we'll discuss that a little bit later too about the importance of research, but I think thank you for um, your comments. We have a question from the audience. Should a social media company be allowed to state that it is not going to moderate or limit the content or comments um, uh, that were posted? So I think this is about kind of transparency of um, their policy. Um, so that limits their liability. 
um, and when user-generated content became a huge thing in the mid-2000s, um, this started to apply to places like YouTube and Facebook as well. Um, but what this means is that they have to take that content down or they can be, they can be legally liable. Um, and so this can also apply to other, other things where legality is an issue, um, child pornography is a big one, uh, spam, um, even in some places certain obscenity laws or hate speech as we mentioned earlier. Um, but there aren't, for the most part, laws around things like protecting people from harmful imagery um, or, do, or requiring someone to intervene if you know that someone is suicidal, for example. So these are the decisions that these companies have to make, but to some extent, there's content that they have to moderate um, because of legal liability. I mean, I'm not sure what would happen if they decided to not, um, but I guess it would not, it would not go over very well. Um, so the other part of that question is whether they should be required to tell their users what kind of content they're moderating. Um, I actually think that this is really important. I think that one of the ways that companies should be moderating content is by making it transparent for the exact reason that I said before, which is that if you don't know what kind of content is being moderated, then how do you learn what the acceptable behavior and content in, in that community is? Um, and being transparent is not putting a line somewhere in your terms of service because no one's going to read it. <laughs> um, and so I think that we should also think about ways to make these practices more, more visible so that they can actually um, move towards social change and not just um, reactive, um, reactive moderation, um, doing something about something when it happens, but instead trying to, trying to change the culture to be to whatever that platform has decided is the more positive way for them. We actually have a user comment that kind of follows up on what you just said. Um, someone wrote, pragmatically users don't disappear by banning, but they come back with new accounts or organize new communities. It is, is it better to ban and diffuse or to keep and contain? That's a great segue to another um, comment that we have from the audience. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I think you know, banning is one of the last resorts. And it's, you know, it's one of those things that we recognize. As you said, we need. sometimes like, people come back, sometimes they spill over, people just move to somewhere else, sometimes it does this work, sometimes. But you know, when we move on from thinking about this kind of policing, reactive way of thinking, and we actually look at the problems that are underlying. Uh, there's a whole new space of interventions and social change that we have available to us 
that we can try. You talked about making it more, more salient. The participants, that's a great example of that social and personal behavior change that you can do you know, well before anyone potentially would have to be banned. And so I think if we want to have the greatest impact on you know, sexism, racism, attacks online, all of the like, range of social problems we see, uh, we need to acknowledge that there are more widespread people social problems and that they're going to need a lot of preventive and social change related work. Uh, and that really banning should be our last resort. Unfortunately, that's a wonderfully large research agenda for us in the folks in this room. So I think we'll take it back up. Just to quickly follow up on that, um, in my work in like online gaming, found that if you ban certain words, people will find a way to say that word in a different way. So there's always going to be ways around it. Um, the comment that I was going to make earlier that was from the audience was um, someone pointing out that uh, giving moderators is a way of giving power to individuals, but that also means there's opportunities for abuse. And like, do we need to moderate moderators? And that creates another layer of, of problems. So I think um, it's definitely a very complex situation. So if you guys want to comment, I want to kind of like throw a wrench or like tangentially go away from this. Um, so hi, I'm Jessica Peter from Georgia Tech. And um, for, from about 2005 to 2012, I worked with middle schools across the state of Georgia to understand what it means to be cyber safe and cyber secure. That was when cyberbullying was coming of age. And what I found was that um, they did not, the, that the youth, and I would say that today is still holds, don't have digital role models. When I was 14 going to the mall for the first time, my parents told me what was risky, what to look out for. If I got into trouble, here's how you get to help. But we don't have any kind of um, corollary into the digital space. And this is, I think, you know, I see and have worked with 14-year-olds that are in 4chan B groups because things that they were doing were being moderated on Facebook and on Twitter. So part of me wants to like ask you what is that corollary how do we scaffold this what we're talking about now into educating the next generation of internet users and how do we keep them from if we're going to moderate content from going to even scarier darker places where we might not even know what they're doing so i really appreciate your question and i think uh, there are a couple of parts of it that i think are really helpful um, the first is this acknowledgement that we're dealing with people who have complex lives that play out across multiple contexts. There's school, there's family, there's this question of role models, and people are using multiple platforms. And so any kind of single platform intervention will have these limitations. Um, and this recognition that people learn, right, that someone's encounter with some moderation or policy is going to influence their longer trajectory. And one uh, really beautiful initiative that I like to talk about um, in, in this area is a study by uh, Elizabeth Levy Pallet at Princeton, where she worked uh, with 56 schools in New Jersey, did a field experiment across, network field experiment across 56 schools, where they found the young people who um, others wanted to impress and be with. And they found there was like four or five people and they did an experiment where they then supported those people to get training in um, conflict resolution strategies. And they also gave them the, a little budget to create um, kind of friendship bracelets, digital rewards, and other forms of appreciation. They could give to the people they saw who exhibited conflict resolution strategies. Um, and they found that by supporting young people to develop their own like efforts at reducing conflict, they were able to reduce disciplinary reports in New Jersey schools by 40%, which is a huge effect size. And I'm sure had all sorts of spillovers into people's digital lives. Great example of uh, you know someone using these tools of network science that are so familiar to us here in this room uh, to imagine an intervention that would help people 
um, help young people kind of take ownership over um, the kind of risks and challenges that they face in their lives. And I would love to see more interventions of that kind and more interventions that can observe the outcome in people's digital mediated behavior. Um. Um, another question from the audience uh, from Brian Keegan was, should users be responsible for self-governance or should they delegate moderation to authorities such as Facebook? And then of course there are a lot of companies that are in between. Um, for example, like Twitch allows their streamers to kind of adjust how much moderation happens on their stream. So there's a wide range of involvement that the company has. Do you have any thoughts on uh, how engaged they should be? Self-governance versus yeah, I more mean, delegation. Yeah, and it will happen, whether or not platforms ask for it. Uh, a, a study by the Data and Society Institute found that around 40%, 47%, I think, of um, U.S. and U.S. adults have taken some action to intervene in cases of um, harassment of some kind. And so that number of people uh, enforcing norms and you know, supporting people, responding to people who are aggressive towards others, massively dwarfs uh, the in, you know, employee count of any platform. And I think for that reason, because the government challenges are so great, uh, platforms have almost always had some form of user moderation, whether it's the librarians of the community memory system in the 1970s, Berkeley, to Facebook, Facebook administrators, Xbox, and Facebook emailers, uh, Reddit, moderators. And I think if the question is, how can we do that justly and fairly and effectively, more so than we should, because it's, it's just baked into uh, the how society is. And how it is. That kind of brings us to the second main question that we had on what factors 
should be taken into consideration when we're thinking about moderation or curation. Um, well, I will, uh, so I'll, I'll bring up my, my point before, which is thinking about ways to make it more transparent for, for the reasons that I've mentioned, um, both for the purpose of making norms more visible so we can actually influence the whole structure of the site, um, but also because I mean, if the, if the rules that, and this is assuming we're talking about platform moderation more than, than user moderation, if the rules are hidden in terms of service, for example, and then users' content is getting deleted, they're not going to understand why. Um, it's not like they read those, right? Um, and so to some extent, we're, we're talking about you know behavior being regulated without, without giving you any heads up that it's going to be regulated. I mean, um, so for example, a lot of people don't realize that the Facebook news feed is curated in any way. Uh, this is one of the reasons why people were so upset about hearing about the Facebook emotional contagion study. It wasn't because of what had been done. It was, oh my gosh, I'm not seeing everything on my news feed. I had no idea that I was being censored. Um, and so I think that that will, often have a similar reaction for their content being moderated if they don't understand the mechanisms behind it um, and the rules, the rules behind it. So um, as somebody who uh, builds computational models, I always um, think about this question about how we can, um, you know, have these algorithms to, um, to actually empower uh, the moderators or the strategies that are, that are on that uh, adopts to deal with uh, risky content instead of uh, uh, having an algorithm to be in the sole authority that either bans content or uh, automatically employs some other uh, moderation uh, technique. So um, I know uh, for a fact that in many um, mental health communities, uh, moderators uh, suffer from the scalability problem, so they don't have enough people to look at the content and content that should uh, be taken down because they are not Uh, these computation models uh, uh, as sort of like a mixed initiative for uh, human machine collaborative uh, uh, systems uh, where they could actually empower uh, people to uh, do a better job uh, and scale their uh, efforts uh, in a way that uh, is helpful for the community. And I think the, the transparency um, question is a very important one. And when we talk about algorithms, other questions also come up. Something that Nate mentioned You know, many times we are dealing with uh, uh, not just uh, fringe uh, segments of the user population, but also uh, people who might be marginalized in one dimension or more. And so it's important when we are thinking about moderation and thinking about these, bringing these computation models to bear on, on, on helping uh, these tasks. Uh, it's also important to think about fairness and um, Speaking of computational models, uh, Andrew McNeil pointed out or asked, is it possible to characterize types of speech so that we can exclude extreme forms of speech while allowing some potentially offensive forms? I think, especially when we're doing algorithmic curation, that is a very tricky um, thing to distinguish. Absolutely, it's, uh, it's very tricky. It's, uh, it's an evolving problem. Um, uh, like I was mentioning earlier, what is hate speech or what is community. So I, I actually don't envision these algorithms to work uh, as standalone systems, but uh, to have uh, some kind of human guidance that can um, help them um, learn in an online fashion to know what these uh, what these changes are going forward so that they're required to find the right kind of linguistic signals or other kinds of signals that the community is And, you know, it's happening all the time. Um, in some of the communities I have studied and worked with on Reddit, uh, one science discussion community, for example, has now over 1,400 volunteer moderators, some of whom spend hours a day 
uh, moderating this community, they also have automated systems that help them make, and in some cases, uh, in one subreddit, they made, they removed 48,000 items just in one month, right, at the kind of height of conflict over uh, a particular political conversation. And they do that in a way that Stuart Geiger calls distributed cognition, where they kind of are constantly tweaking the um, rules and training of their algorithms, and also constantly reversing the decisions made by the algorithms that they kind of deploy into their communities, hoping desperately to manage sometimes massive conversations. Um, and, you know, nobody is entirely happy with it, but not everyone acknowledges that, or most people acknowledge that uh, without the extensions of the human capacity, um, certain particularly bad conversations might be even worse crash fires than they already are. And hopefully, you know, as the computational systems become more accountable, more easily trained, more easily tweaked, uh, the kind of overlap between the will of the community and its capacity to handle a large volume may converge uh, more closely. So I think your point about reversing decisions is actually really important. Um, so again, like some of the like original content moderation is around copyright, right? Because of the liability. Um, and so I I mean, that all of you have probably at some point gone to YouTube and seen like a black box and it says, this video has been removed due to a copyright claim from like, your favorite music studio. Um, and uh, so this is mostly done algorithmically now. So YouTube has an automated content ID system where you know they have a music library and when someone uploads a video, it immediately tries to match it to this library, and then if it's a match, then various things happen based on what the copyright owner wants it. So it might take it down, it might put ads on it, and give that money to the copyright owner, um, these, these sorts of things. Um, so basically, an algorithm will never be able to um, to identify fair use. I mean, it's just it's it's almost impossible. Um, and so there are there are false positives for the system. Um, but the only way to deal with false positives in the system is for the YouTube user who gets a scary letter saying, you know, so and so, you, you know, cease and desist, so, so and so has, uh, has said that your this work is, is copyrighted. Um, here's how you file a counter notice, but be really careful because if you're wrong, then you'll get in lots of trouble. That's, this is actually a direct quote from their, like, animated cartoon version of copyright law. <laughs> um, and it makes it sound really, really scary. So there's this really heavy imbalance of power there where the, the, um, the moderation system doesn't really have a, have a human component and the mechanism of fighting it sounds really scary. Um, and so I know from my work that basically people don't fight it. Um, and so I think that it's really important that in any kind of moderation system that there's some, there's some form of, of, of governance where you can say, no, that, that content was actually okay, because otherwise you're just going to drive users away from the community because they're going to feel like they're not welcome. Um, we've talked a lot about like algorithmic moderation. I want to turn the conversation a little bit back to human moderation. Um, we know recently many companies have been starting employing more people to monitor uh, deviant content on the internet. Uh, there's a question from the audience saying, for content that is moderated by a human, is there research that helps support the humans who do this considering the content they review can be traumatizing? Um, and I'm not familiar with any research on traumatized moderators, but I do know that there's a lot of research on um, people uh, who work at, in telephone, kind of customer service, um, who, who have to kind of deal with like malicious content over time. Are you familiar with any research on the moderators who have to really look at, go through a lot of negative content? So um, I can say a little bit from the perspective of um, uh, crisis counselors, so not necessarily moderators, but you can imagine um, uh, moderators of certain communities playing a very similar role where they're trying to help individuals to express vulnerable and uh, then moderating these communities to uh, match them with the right kind of support at the right uh, time uh, as much as possible. And um, I, I think um, a lot of these crisis platforms do have uh, uh, what they call training programs uh, to help uh, the individuals um, be a little bit more familiar and, and uh, sort of like build an emotional shield around them that they can, um, that they can uh, really rely on um, as they're doing these uh, uh, these jobs, and uh, I think they, some communities even have, I think, uh, uh, informal 
alarms in terms of the hours that you put looking at this kind of content, the things that you say you can do, um, uh, you're moderating this kind of content for so long, or not even that, and uh, it comes to that. Uh, but I don't think that there is a formal um, set of, um, I don't know, um, best practices uh, that communities have come up with, uh, and I think it's much So, um, a couple of years ago, I was fortunate to facilitate a crowdsourced lit review of uh, research related to online harassment. It's on the Wikimedia site uh, under Online Harassment Resource Guide. And we looked at this question of secondary trauma. Lindman is right that there isn't a lot of public research on like, moderators specifically. There's, there's work on crisis counseling, there's work on social workers, and there's also work, some work on uh, journalists who do social media curation. Sadly, there's almost no causal research on this. But the studies we do have suggest that these secondary trauma uh, risks have to do with um, uh, making it, kind of putting stresses on people's familial relationships, actually uh, kind of reductions in the satisfaction that people find in their romantic relationships and people's capacity to kind of feel um, kind of authentic, what they consider to be authentic emotions in their personal lives. There's a long uh, tradition of study around the idea of emotion work in sociology that's highly relevant to it. And I know Amanda Menken has written about that in the context of Wikipedia. Uh, but so far, at least when we did our review, um, uh, things like self-care and other interventions didn't seem to have any effect on the secondary trauma outcomes. If the only one at least the last time we checked, uh, being the one that Moon mentioned today, which was staggering people encounters with particularly violent uh, uh, information. And it really took like one or two day breaks every couple of days to um, reduce uh, the effects on the secondary things that are common in the community. So that's a much needed area of research as it becomes more labor. As more people do this on a volunteer basis, data and society found that the people who are most likely to intervene in an informal way are often the people who are most vulnerable. People of color, women, LGBT communities, because they are more likely to see it. And so when you have people who are the greatest at risk, also being the people who are bearing the greatest emotional and secondary trauma burden, like that's a particularly pernicious combination that further research could uh, make incredibly valuable mm -hmm. Thinking of it from the perspective of someone who is being moderated, do they, how many chances do they deserve? And should we, uh, there's a question here, should we embed forgiveness and forgetfulness, or should moderation be stigmatizing? Um, how many chances does someone get before, let's say, they're banned from their system, or um, like how do we deal with kind of people who are co constantly trying to um, gain the system with deviant content? So there are different, even just when you're thinking about, for example, social norm enforcers, um, there are different, different strategies for this. So even if a community was just uh, moderating itself, for, for example, and if we're going, if we're moving away from the let's just delete the content, but thinking about um, how to maybe in encourage, like, teach people what the rules are, what the norms are. Um, so there are um, reintegrative and disintegrative ways of uh, enforcing norms, which is basically, um, hello, I, I, I see you did this thing. Here's the thing that you should have done instead. Versus you did a bad thing, public shaming. Um, some of my work has suggested that the first is better um, because it will encourage it will encourage people to stay in the community but know the rules as opposed to saying, oh, you're bad, get out. Uh, but on the other hand, um, if they're gonna just keep if they're gonna if they're gonna keep doing something, I mean so, someone asked earlier about like like banning people versus versus not uh, banning people, for example. And you know, in my opinion, if at if at some point 
um, someone is clearly aware of all of the rules, if they have been made publicly aware of the rules, you know that they you know that they know them. It's not just that their content's getting deleted and we don't know why, um, but they're continuing to behave in a way that is um, not acceptable to the community. Then at that point, it just kind of becomes polling, right? Like it's like it's a conscious decision to act in this way. Um, but this, I feel like this works slightly differently when you're talking about like a community moderating itself versus um, like a platform doing moderation. Right. Like I'm very much on board with like the community deciding, no, you do not, you do not belong here. Um, versus like you know a platform making that decision because then the community members themselves might might not actually uh, agree with it. But it also brings us back to the question of what is a community and on certain social media like Facebook or Twitter, what does that what does that even mean? So I quickly also wanted to add to what Casey uh, just said. Um, it's a very difficult question to figure out, you know, how many chances somebody deserves. Um, I think before that we have to answer the question what is the intent? Because um, uh, uh, you know people may or may not have uh, the wrong intentions uh, when they're sharing uh, content that violates the norms of the community or the norms of the platform. So I think um, we also need to figure out a way, and it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to answer or measure, is what the intent of the person is. And if the intent is not wrong, uh, and I'm wrong, we can right or wrong, we can pretend, you know, based on what the community thinks to be right or wrong. And I think in those situations, moderation can awareness systems where um, individuals uh, are educated about um, what is the right thing to say and what is the right thing to say. I guess, yeah, if this keeps on repeating, that's probably the same. I, I think this is one of those areas where these three questions, justice, legitimacy, and effectiveness, actually help us gain purchase on, on this issue. Like, there's the justice question. Maybe you're in a vulnerable community, and like, one strike is really all you can allow. Because if people are really being harmed, you just can't risk it. Uh, but there might be other contexts where you're worried that that pushes people elsewhere and you have more leeway. Um, then there's this legitimacy question that Casey pointed out. Like, do we trust platforms that have legitimate power? Do we trust governments? Do we trust the community that have legitimate power? But then there's the question that seems to be also uh, kind of behind what this question is, which was, what is effective? And that's where I think uh, supporting communities to do their own randomized trials can be incredibly valuable. In fact, I have a pre-analysis and currently published to the Open Science Framework um, that looks at this question. And you can imagine uh, a wide range of communities with different risk uh, kind of profiles, with different norms, uh, with different concerns and goals. Uh, doing similar experiments, replicating each other's studies, and finding out in my community, is a free strike system going to work? If so, what are the best ways to walk people through those strikes? And does that lead to the outcomes that you care about? And so when we combine those answers to justice, legitimacy, and effectiveness, I think we end up with a clearer path as a community and a society for answering those questions. I want to come back to the role of academics in a little bit, but to address the point of effectiveness, um, there's a question about, are there any examples of social media companies that are actually doing a good job preventing all types of online risks? What can we learn from them? Um, and I'd really like to invite especially our uh, industry partners in the room, if you could share some great example of uh, what you're doing uh, in your system that you have found to be effective. Um, I welcome you to either um, post uh, or um, come up here to the mic. Um, but for the panel, in the meantime, can you think of any online platforms that you think are doing a good job? I mean, maybe they're not doing a 100% good job, but maybe in like one area they're doing a good job. So, um, 
so each individual subreddit has its own rules, has its own moderators, and they work slightly differently. But in theory, you should be able to step into a subreddit, interact with it, and figure out what is kind of acceptable um, for that particular community. And you're, and, and you're not going to get this in something that's a much broader community like, like Twitter. Like, it's not, it's not clear what the norms are for Twitter because it's so many different communities that, that, that clash. And I think that this is one of the reasons why we often run into problems are, like, spaces that are not um, kind of one single community because we have clashes of norms and clashes of, of rules and these kinds of things. Um, so I, I, I tend to see the best results in that moderate themselves. Like, Facebook groups are another good example. Um, so, I, I mean, in, in, in my experience, the best examples of these are platforms that get, that empower communities to govern themselves um, in various ways. I think that's a great point about the smaller communities because one of the reasons I really like Twitch is that every person who um, puts their streaming content online has the option to choose what, how they moderate their own little community. So um, in that sense, it's like very, there's a lot of autonomy for the person who's generating the user-generated content. But I realize for other communities, that's more difficult. Yeah, so I think you know, when we look at a platform, there are a few questions we can ask if we want to come to our own answer about how to create it. Um, one question to ask is, are they putting resources into like the issues I care about, where they could plausibly have some intervention. And you know, some companies are more able to allocate resources than others. Reddit is a great example of a company that has invested more than in the past, partly in response to activism by their users. Um, and uh, but they're, you know, just as an observer of the, the industry, I should note that I've, I have no formal relationships with any company that can go and accept funding from companies. Just so you can so it can be transparent. Um, but you know, they collect less personal data, their advertising system is less lucrative than other platforms, and so they have fewer resources to put into these issues than a company like Facebook, which has you know almost a decade of like engagement over different platforms. And that second carrot, that level of, kind of responsiveness and participation, is another question to ask whether it's the delegation that is given to communities on Reddit or, or Facebook groups, or whether it's the engagement with scholars or advocates in groups like Twitter's Trust and Safety Advisory Council or Facebook's similar group. That's, that kind of responsiveness uh, kind of speaks to that question of legitimacy. Of where are they getting their ideas? To what degree are they to And then the third area as a researcher, to what degree are they doing work that is based on evidence that is transparent? So we look at you know, organizations like Nextdoor, which while they haven't published the full results of their efforts to kind of reduce um, racial profiling on their platform, have at least admitted publicly that they've done field experiments and they've re re reported the effect sizes um, on the interventions that they designed together with police departments and communities affected by racial profiling. Just to kind of follow up on your comments about Reddit, someone from the audience said, Reddit banned the sub-communities fat people hate and trans fags, um, but they migrated to a different site, vote.co. Is it Reddit's fault for forcing these deviant users into darker corners? Um, well, I mean, to go back to my point before, this might be, I mean, it's, this, this might be a positive outcome because now they're in a place where they can do their thing and people know not to go there. I mean, you, you, could, you could say that this was kind of the case on um, on Reddit previously because, you know, it's clear from the titles of those subreddits that perhaps those are not the friendliest places on the internet. Um, but, the, but the reason that Reddit banned them was because of uh, harassment. Um, and this is a case, I mean, well, this is actually a case of, of Reddit's liability. So if someone wants to set up a site where they don't care about harassment, they don't care about liability, they don't care about the potential of hurting people, and everyone knows that this is exactly what their stance is, then we have created a dark corner of the internet that is unfortunate. But I wouldn't say that it's Reddit's fault, and this is a really a case of you know exactly what you're getting into when you go there. I also wanted to add um, um, something that we haven't talked about. But I, I think it's a pretty uh, effective moderation strategy. Uh, so Tumblr employs 
uh, public service announcements on uh, specific kinds of expressions of uh, uh, dangerous behaviors. Um, uh, I don't think Tumblr has released any information on the efficacy of these moderation techniques, but I, I can envision this to be um, a mechanism by which uh, platforms uh, are able to uh, uh, tackle you know, these difficult situations involving sharing of risk and content without outright banning individuals or posts or communities. Um, and in fact, these, you know, you can envision that going forward, these uh, uh, public service announcements to um, factor into uh, more of the nuances in these uh, uh, risky content and uh, maybe even tailor them to the specific users who are in there they find them too. So I think this is, uh, uh, the, the PSAs are definitely uh, a promising uh, uh, strategy of moderation which I think is underexplored and it is the I think we've all mentioned at a certain point about how important it is to do research. And uh, as a, academics, of course, we have a bias towards that. But I was wondering if you could discuss a little bit about what role, if any, do academic academics have in intervening or discussing industry about their practices? So you know, I think we have a like, massive, dramatically huge shortfall in our knowledge for addressing these problems. Um, partly because like, online risks evolve rapidly, uh, and partly because we're talking about the risks that pervade society worldwide. We have platforms that are literally reaching billions of people and increasingly expected to intervene in those people's lives. And you know, when we look at the area of online harassment and moderation, we have less than 10 calls or studies um, of any kind in this space. There's a couple of randomized trials um, when it comes to field research. There are, you know, there are there's a great tradition of lab research, which is really wonderful. Um, that gives us a theoretical, you know, valuable perspective. But when it comes to field research, testing things out in the world or doing observation studies like you've done, we are like, we have paltry levels of causal, causal knowledge. And uh, to get to the point where research could actually guide people's interventions across cultures, think a platform like Reddit, where you, you have you're over 100,000 active communities, to get to the point where uh, moderators would feel like they have a locally appropriate, usable, effective knowledge on how to deal with them. We're talking about thousands, if not tens of thousands, of studies. Um, and so I would argue that we need to reinvent how we do research. And just as we talk about platforms delegating power to their communities to set policies, what I've done in my research has been to support communities to also do their own field experiments, their own A-B tests to answer these questions, to replicate each other's studies with the goal of being able to generate thousands of new studies a year so that our knowledge can adapt and respond to emerging data. Uh, that's what I'm hoping to do with the civil service nonprofit, which we announced this week. So if there are researchers here who want to help support that vision, um, I'm actively recruiting people to help do that and help us figure out how to expand and sustain that. But I do think that whether we're reinventing uh, new causal research through you know, design-based or observational efforts or doing new kinds of qualitative work, I think we really need to ask what, what are the infrastructures and ecosystems of research that can actually provide more than most people that will need it? Aaron. <coughs> you had a comment? I, I can wait for this time to open. Um. Um, the other thing that, that I would add is that uh, the one thing that academics can do that is study things cross platform, which I don't actually think we do enough of. Um, so we have a lot of, we have a lot of work that's like this thing on Facebook and this thing on Instagram and this thing on Tumblr. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, Facebook isn't going to do a study of moderation practices across platforms other than Facebook. Um, and so I think that that's something that academics can offer is to, is to um, be able to look at how things are more uh, original. Um, just to quickly add to that, I think, um, um, you know, there are tremendous opportunities to actually work with the online communities, collaborate with the moderators, um, uh, 
uh, to emphasize what uh, Nate was saying that you know allow these communities to do their own um, uh, causal studies. I think that can be really uh, powerful and uh, uh, for I think, an academic and industries. It's very often for machine learning as well. Yes. Hi, <laughs> uh, I'm Eric Gilbert from Georgia Tech. Um, I want to say this has been great, so thank you for doing this. It's been a really good panel. I want to put forth a somewhat cynical position that I want you to knock down. Uh, the corporations that own these platforms pay the bills, they set the rules. For the most part, I will reflect conversations I've had over drinks with people that this is largely a nuisance to them. And they deal with it, I think you can point to a number of examples, Twitter, Reddit, they deal with it once it becomes a threat to the business. What's the argument that they should deal with it at some higher level than it's a threat to my ad revenue, therefore I will act now? What is the argument for these higher-minded societal level governance, what's good for people, arguments that kind of have pervaded this discussion, I think are important, but I think we have to get to the step of, let's make the case that you should do something actively, proactively, as opposed to respond to threats to the business, which is, I think, the state of the art, right? Oh, I can't close a funding round because my brand is associated with bad people? Let's kick the bad people, right? That's, that's what's happening now, basically. I'm willing to throw that. I mean, uh, to some extent, I mean, there's like, I'm not, I'm not going to suggest that company X or company Y doesn't care about uh, and, and, all right, so Eric, Eric suggests that Company X does not care about people. There is, there is no particular way, I think, to make Company X care about people. Um, and, and, and so the, the, what you have to do is tie the caring about people into the business model, which is exactly what you said you know, happens now. Uh, but I would think that, that as this kind of thing keeps unfolding, that it becomes clearer and clearer that it is bad business to be to not care about people because it will come out eventually. Um, so I so I recently judged this um, technology ethics competition at my university where um, there were these groups of law students and computer science students and business students together who were like solving this ethical dilemma about social media companies. Um, and and one of the groups came, was uh, basically came up with this solution to this problem that was like, we're just going to try to keep this information from our users so that they never find out because then they will keep using our system and we'll make lots of money. And uh, we're like, well, <laughs> you have just made you have just made a horrible business decision. Actually, it was clear that like the business students in this group dominated, um, and. But you've made a poor business decision because there's enough of a chance now that this is going to come out and you're going to get horrible PR and then like you're going to be, you know, Uber to be like, you know, of, of like like companies that keep getting slammed for, for ethical things in, in the media. And sometimes they're not even totally legitimate. Like the media totally blew the Facebook emotional contagion study up in like a, a, a way that it, you know, it was a bit more overblown than perhaps it should have been. Um, and I think that we're to a point where companies just have to think about this, like how is this going to be seen by the public? And that is a cynical way of looking at it, but that's, let's we keep calling them out. I have, a, <laughs> I have a slightly different perspective. I think that they should care about this because there will be, there might be another competitor that deals with this in a better way and people will just migrate. Um, I don't know if you remember, uh, there was a site called Juicy Campus a while back. It was kind of like Yik Yak, and I guess Yik Yak never learned the lesson from Juicy Campus. But um, it w just became a really toxic space, and people didn't like it, and it just kind of self-dissolved because people moved to another space. And I think, of course, it's tricky when you have services like Facebook um, that have like billions of users, and like they're not going to migrate overnight. But there's always, if someone comes up with a better system, there's always like, uh, market competition. So I think that they should think about, of course, the ethics is important. We all need to make like good human decisions. But I think they should also think about that. Um, so I just wanted to quickly add, um, as somebody who has spent a little bit of time doing industry research, um, I wouldn't like put 
you know, a, a blanket um, a statement that um, companies do not care about users. Um, I think many of them do. Um, how they care, that differs in terms of how we think they should care and how they think they, they care. Um, what happens with these kind of content is that, as we were just discussing this before the panel, is these communities are often perceived to be uh, fringe communities, so these problems are also considered to be fringe problems um, until you know, they become uh, really big, uh, and which is why I think communities are not allocating as much resources, effort, and, and uh, whatnot uh, to, to address that. Uh, but I think you know we have seen the last few years that many, many companies are trying to at least move in a direction where they have some stake in the societal good. Um, We're running out of time, so. I will try to be brief. Um, so Eric pointed out a particularly um, unfortunate cycle uh, where some societal ill is identified, often with a particular case that's horrific. People put pressure on companies to do something, and then they do something. And that's what happened in the Instagram case that you studied. And the, there, was, there was an effort put in so quickly that it took years before someone came in and actually evaluated whether that uh, policy made a difference. And so we absolutely need to move beyond that particular like pressure PR respond do something cycle. And we need to find a way to do that that um, actually respects companies' acknowledgement that they're not governments. Right? When we pressure them to govern our lives, we're asking them to do something that companies aren't necessarily designed for structure to do. So this is actually one area where I think we have a great opportunity to collaborate with a uh, platform to acknowledge the fact that um, we can't rely on them to decide what is acceptable behavior for humanity and bear the kinds of responsibility that we sometimes wish they'll bear. And we need to find um, kind of more publicly accountable, more participatory, democratic processes for actually addressing these challenges. Um, and part of that involves companies caring, but hopefully that involves companies caring in ways that hew towards democracy and an open society. Thank you. Um, Mumma and Casey, do you have any kind of final remarks or calls to action um, that you would like to share? To piggyback on that, I think it's really important, and I'm kind of preaching to the choir here at Kai, but a lot of times designers design things without thinking about the social consequences in mind. And I think our community here really values you know, user research, but that is not necessarily the norm uh, in all industries. So I think it's really important to think about when I'm designing this thing, like thinking about like how people will use it and what kind of impact it would have. I think it would introduce a different kind of design program to those, uh, paradigm to those who are engaging in it. Um, so with that, um, thank you so much for joining our panel. Thank you so much for your wonderful questions. I'm sorry if I weren't, wasn't able to address all of them, but feel free to uh, stay behind and have some more conversations with our panelists.